Welcome back to Talking Europe and indeed the European Parliament. With me now I have the Chair of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, British MEP for the Labour Party, uh, Mr Claude Maurice. Uh, thanks for your time. Now you've, you were chairing a roundtable on managing uh, migration uh, in the, the EU this week, but managing it is exactly what we're failing to do, isn't it? I think there's a huge failure in this particular subject and it's an existential problem for the European Union. It's an existential problem for the whole of the West, let's be honest. The Euro European Union, Europe, the United States, Canada, I mean all of these countries are affected by a global movement and that global movement is the introduction of technology, the rise of poverty, climate change, war. I mean, if I, if I explain to you that there are now 60 million refugees, the highest number the world has ever seen, but half of those, half, come from just three countries. Syria, that, that explains, yes, that explains a failure of um, the wealthier world um, to manage migration because most of those refugees, over most of those 60 million, yes, over 80% are, are countries. pouring so into poorer they, countries. So how can they yes. do it and not the EU? Well, they're all pouring into poorer countries because those poorer countries are either neighbouring countries, mm. they are either more generous, uh, they are willing to accommodate refugees. Um, the West, of course, is not doing that. But in addition to that, they're communicating to their citizens that they're full up. You know, they're, com they're communicating to their citizens that they don't have that responsibility. And, and the EU as a and, and, block, yes, we're and, 500 million people. Yeah. We have quite substantial 28 different countries. We have wealth. We have wealth and we have space, but we also have populist politicians who are influencing mainstream politics. Are they the majority? And the media. No, but they have a voice. Um, they have a voice in France, as you know. They have a voice in my country. And those populists say to, the, to people, these people who are coming in are going to take your jobs. These people who are coming in are going to create pressure for you. Now, this message is very, very effective and it's not true because we know that migration is necessary. We know that it actually can create wealth in society. And yes, it has costs as well, but you can measure those costs. You can create integration. Um, and also some immigration is pretty much inevitable. But when are we going to see EU action? Because even, you know, we saw a deal two years years ago to, to actually just address a tiny fraction of the amount of refugees coming into the EU. The 28 member states decided we'll have a relocation plan. Certain countries didn't play ball. No consequences. Absolutely. I agree with you. It has been a massive failure. This huge existential problem, a massive failure by member states. Not by the European Commission. I'm not in the Commission. Not by, let me finish the point, not by the European Parliament because there is the EU-Turkey deal. Not many people like it. Uh, there are many measures like relocation, like resettlement, all on the table. I've been here for years and there's been an asylum package. There have been laws about resettlement, about qualifications and so on. If I finish the point, the point is this, and I, I'll get this message across very clearly to your listeners. The member states, France, Britain, Italy, Germany, but not so much Germany these days, don't come together as a, as a group and say, let's relocate some people, let's have burden sharing, the so-called Dublin uh, law. You know, it's just sitting there in the council and the member states and there is no real burden sharing. That means that Germany and Sweden take a disproportionate share but other countries don't. Well, indeed, the, the Dublin regulation that are, the UK, Ireland and Denmark had opted out of is one thing, but also today, I mean, you can say it's the member state's problem, but what is the point of the EU if, when it comes to the EU government in Brussels, that it doesn't have any power? Is that the reality? There's, is there any point to There's always a tension then? at the heart of the EU. And that tension is that when the EU is working well and the member states are working well together and you get huge benefits. I mean, you know, this is the, the two weeks when we have the end of roaming charges. You know, you have great prosperity over the years um, because of the European Union and its single market. There's great tension at the heart of the European Union. When it doesn't stick together, when we don't stick together for these existential crises like the refugee crisis, then we fail. So the European Union is not some static thing. It is a, it is a sum of its member states. It is its people. So it doesn't work. It's not just a building. It, it, it is the people who are in it. In this building are different political parties. 
It's not just one institution, one building or a set of buildings. When it doesn't work, then it is a very public failure. And on refugees, that has happened. Is there any new line of action when it comes to refugee? I know back in April, some 90 million uh, euros was set aside, uh, mostly to look at the detention centres or where people are, are camping out in Libya, often in very appalling conditions. Human Rights Watch are also concerned that the EU is now handing over, uh, you know, the, 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 the Mediterranean Sea to the Libyan Coast Guard to look after. Uh, they say that that's not really going to help the people who are either fleeing war or oppression of some sort. The NGOs have got some very, very real concerns, and I, th I agree with many of them because you know you have some real concerns in the EU Turkey deal you have some real concerns on Libya of course many of our member states including France Britain intervened in Libya and now we see many consequences of this but we are dealing with the Mediterranean but let me also say there are many positives too it, the Italian state is is really working very hard on hot spots on dealing with what's happening in the Mediterranean but it's not getting enough help Greece is not getting enough help from other member states, but there are some improvements. So I don't want to, I don't want to um, uh, diminish those positives as well, because you know I've been to, I was in Greece a couple of weeks ago. I've seen the hard work of the Greek people, of of the EU, of the UNHCR, of all the the teams and the, the NGOs working together. So let me be very clear about that. And there are many improvements, but. It is an EU failure as a whole because the member states don't work together in the hotspots which are the Western Balkans. And there's no the way of putting Balkans. that EU pressure yeah. as a block. There's no well, way to, you know, to this, force. This, this, um, this high-level meeting we've just had, you know, I, I was part of the organisation of this, was to try to get it into the heads of the council, the member states, um, who met straight afterwards that they need to do something on this, they can't leave it. Clearly the crisis is deepening and I think we'll have another phase of that, by the way. Uh, you know, I have to be very transparent about this. And the, the member states, you know, in the EU we have some of the wealthiest countries in the world. So we can do it, um, we can integrate people, um, and also we benefit too from migration, remember. It's not a one-way street. No, absolutely. And when you say we have, we have some of the wealthiest uh, states and one of our uh, powerful ones was the UK that, of course, opted uh, to vote to leave the European Union. How big a, an issue was migration in that vote? Seen from the outside, a lot of people felt that that's what it came down to. There were many factors. I mean, you could say it was migration. It was also the way our press treated the issue of migration, the way that they conflated the EU and migration. Um, but there's no question that migration was a big issue. But remember in the United Kingdom, we've had 30 years of the denigration of the EU. We've had a particularly anti-EU press. I think people would agree with that statement. Um, and it was a very big fight in this referendum uh, to win it, you know, whatever anyone says. And I think today, I think views may be changing. Uh, they now see um, some of the impact of Brexit, even before we've left. They see the first day of negotiation wasn't quite what people expected. And I think it's dawning on people now that, you know, this is not going to be as easy as they thought it was going to be. And remember, United Kingdom is still a country where the media, press and broadcasting, in my view, don't give the full picture of both the negative and positive of the European Union. And, I, and, and that may be the case in other countries, but I think it's particularly acute in the UK. And I, I suspect over the next year or so, um, it will be interesting to see the views of the British people on, on what it will really mean economically, um, culturally, socially, um, for, particularly for young people um, of coming out of the, United, of the European Union. Well, indeed, after that first day of official formal talks began, we did take a look at how uh, certain businesses were reacting across in London and that, what they hoped uh, they would see come out of these Brexit talks in the long term. Let's take a look. We agreed on organisation. Brexit negotiations and are underway agreed. with the prospect of a final deal within the time frame too uncertain now. for some. Have a shared responsibility. Many question marks hang. The UK Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders says it doesn't believe Britain will be able to strike a full and comprehensive deal with the EU. In a statement it said, Our biggest fear is that in two years' time we fall off a cliff edge, no deal, outside the single market and customs union and trading on inferior WTO terms. We need the government to seek an interim arrangement. Do you think that no deal is better than a bad deal? 
The British Finance Minister, Philip Hammond, acknowledges no those fears. Would be a very, very bad outcome. So how do we achieve this Brexit for Britain? Firstly, by securing a comprehensive agreement for trade in goods and services. Secondly, by negotiating mutually beneficial transitional arrangements to avoid unnecessary disruption and dangerous cliff edges. The Bank of England governor, meanwhile, is signalling a rocky road ahead, saying he sees a direct link between the Brexit process and weaker real income growth. In the coming months, I'd like to see the extent to which weaker consumption growth is offset by other components of demand, whether wages begin to firm, and more generally, how the economy reacts to the prospect of tighter financial conditions and the reality of Brexit negotiations. Carney said that before long the UK will find out the extent to which Brexit is a gentle stroll to a land of cake and consumption, a tone enough to put British industry and the city on edge. Well, there you can see already some concerns of what it could be uh, once the UK leaves the EU. Uh, business is saying even when it comes to this migration question, they will be in jeopardy. Uh, however, Brexiteers say, uh, well, we're not ending migration, we're just making it more fair. The Great Britain will be open to the world, not just the EU. I mean, your package didn't show some concerns, they showed major concerns. The speech by Mark Carney in the Bank of England, if you listen carefully to those words, you know, you should be worried, deeply worried. I, I represent London um, as a member of the European Parliament and people are deeply worried because we have not left the European Union yet. We have a low, weak pound. So, of course, there are still benefits, but it's dawning on people uh, already what this could mean. They, they are learning what it would mean to have, you know, so-called no deal, WTO rules, tariff barriers and non-tariff barriers. Suddenly people are beginning to realise what really was not being talked about in the, the media and the broadcasting and indeed, of course, our own press. And now people are realising that this will affect people, but also the many other things that we have to sort out apart from this. There'll be a big gap when we, 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 we will not have a comprehensive free trade deal. And in that gap, there are many other things we have to sort out. Yesterday, I was talking to groups of lawyers from all over Britain, um, and they were here in Brussels, and they were telling me about um, basic consumer mutual recognitions between you know, British citizens and, and those in the EU, you know, basic things that will go wrong, the way that payments might be late and they can't do anything about no, it because there's no mutual there. recognition. Now, all these rules have to be sorted out. We don't have the time between now and 2019 to do it. This is going to dawn on people. And, you know, I think our government has not done enough to prepare people for this in the United Kingdom. I think the preparation on the EU side has been much stronger. That is also deeply worrying. But representing London, I can tell you now that the economic damage, the damage of not getting the right kind of migration uh, to, to a place like London is, is bad. And you know, there are more French people in London than probably any other major city outside France, I think. And I mean, that, that argument from pro-Brexit uh, politicians who say, well, look, we're leaving the door open to the whole world at an equal level. We're not closing to all migration. I mean, the thing about it is, is that after we have Brexit, we also have a lot of migration to the UK because in a growing economy, you need migration. And if we are not having migration, this will be very bad for Britain because it means that our economy will be contracting or not growing. And that is the, that is the worry. And I think now people are realising, particularly some people who thought this is a great way to reduce migration. Um, and I think, you know, you look at what the point of all of this is. I mean, the big plan of many Brexiteers now seems to be to get a kind of Swiss-style system. Um, and we're learning this bit by bit. And that's making people even more angry because a Swiss-style system would require some migration uh, for work from the EU to the UK. It would require us to pay into the budget of the EU. It would require no controls over what is actually happening to us democratically. So, you know, if that is their vision, you have to ask what was the point of Brexit. And I think um, it, both in the short term and in that long-term scenario, um, both French citizens watching this and many British ones will ask, 
what was the point? And um, I am interested to see what the point was. Because I think right now, very finally, we're running out of time, but the, the, the big question a lot of us have now is what kind of Brexit is the UK still looking for? Is it what we seem to have seen this week from David Days is still this, what is being termed a hard Brexit, leaving the single market, leaving the customs union, really making a clean swipe? Or could we still see that change and have maybe staying in the single market, trying to, but then that comes with freedom of movement. I suspect we'll see a change. I don't know what kind of change, but the change will come because this is a politically weak government. On the first day of negotiations, it was a very weak start to those negotiations. It was a badly prepared first day uh, by the exiting the UK secretary, uh, David Davis. And I think um, he was going in as part of a government uh, that, that talked the talk but didn't walk the walk. I mean, they had a Brexit election to get an increased majority. They got a reduced majority. They lost their majority on a Brexit election. And now we have, instead of strong and stable government, which was the catchword of Theresa May, we now have um, a weak government and a chaotic coalition. And, and, and it's up to the opposition parties now um, to look for something uh, which will preserve jobs and growth. Um, and although the Labour Party wants an exit, it's, it it's pursuing now, yeah. this line. And I think... So think, Brexit is definitely happening in some form or another. I, I mean, I, I, think, I think to be completely transparent um, with your viewers, I, I think you know it would be wrong to say that we're not seeing Brexit. We're going to see Brexit, uh, but we're going to see a different kind of Brexit probably because this hard Brexit of the Conservative Party, I don't think will stand the test of time because they're too weak. Okay, Mr. Claude Maurice, uh, British Labour MEP and, of course, Chair of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks also, of course, to you at home for having watched. That brings us to the end of this edition of Talking Europe. Have a good week. See you again next time.